This video was sponsored by Card Kingdom. You can visit their store by using my referral link in the description below. Hi everyone, I'm Nita Hone, and it's Friday, and that means it's time for another MTG Top 10, the series where I rank cards based on their historical performance at Magic's highest level of competition. At least, that's normally what I do in this series. From time to time, I like to do something that's based more on my opinion, and that's definitely what we're doing today. Today's the last MTG Top 10 of 2021, and every single year since 2017, I've used the last MTG Top 10 of the year to talk about my favorite cards that came out that year. So in this video, I'll be giving my picks for my favorite cards of 2021. To be eligible for this list, a card had to receive its first printing in 2021. This means most cards from Kaldheim, Strixhaven, Modern Horizons 2, Adventures in the Forgotten Realms, and both Innistrad sets are eligible for this list. I'm approaching most of this list from the perspective of a limited player, as that's how I play the vast majority of my magic. All right, let's get started. My 10th favorite card of the year was Kalein Reclusive Painter. It isn't any secret that I think Forgotten Realms is the worst limited format since the release of Magic Arena, but there are at least a few bright spots in the set, and one of them was the black-red archetype. It covered new ground, especially for red-black, and it was really interesting for Treasure to be the primary focus of the deck, and they found lots of neat ways to pay you off for using it, with Kalein as the signpost uncommon, she seemed like the right card to include here to represent that deck. Of course, that deck was also far and away the best one in the entire format, and that was part of the problem with it, but still, I really like the innovation this archetype brought to the table. At number 9, I've got Rise of the Ants. While I do draft whatever deck is open and strategize based on a limited format's metagame, at my core, I'm someone who likes to play slow, grindy decks. Not all limited formats allow you to go that route, but Midnight Hunt was a format where that was very possible, and a card like Rise of the Ants was a big part of that. In general, I really enjoyed the blue-green self-mill deck the most of any deck in the format, and Rise of the Ants was great there. If you managed to get to the point of the game where you could both cast it and flash it back, it was very unlikely any deck was ever going to finish you off, and the feeling one gets when they stabilize is one of the best feelings in all of Magic, and I got to have that feeling a lot thanks to Rise of the Ants. At number 8, I've got Brinecomber. This Crimson Vow signpost in common has a really neat design, one that is simultaneously very similar for blue-white, while also being pretty innovative. We've seen limited formats where blue-white is about flyers, and we've seen formats where blue-white is about auras, but in Crimson Vow, they made it so that Cards with Disturb came back from the graveyard as auras, and that was pretty cool. They took a mechanic we had just seen a lot of in Midnight Hunt and changed it up enough to make for some really interesting gameplay. Anytime there's a design or an archetype that actually makes auras playable and limited, I'm pretty happy, and Brinecomber and cards like it really made sure that was the case. At number 7, it's Ominous Roost. This was a card that I was really pumped about from the moment it was previewed. If you don't know, I have an affinity for birds, and magic cards with great bird art are always something I like. Anytime a card with great bird art also happens to be right up my alley and limited, I'm even more excited, and that was definitely the case with the Roost. Build-arounds are always really interesting, and obviously enough, the Roost wants you to go all in on doing stuff with your graveyard, and pays you off by giving you an army of 1-1 flying tokens. I was a bit down on this card a few weeks into the format, but luckily I ended up being wrong, and this card ended up being pretty sweet, especially in blue-green decks in Midnight Hunt Limited. At number 6, I have Gluttonous Guest. I guess I just like black-red artifact token-based archetypes because... I really like the black-red blood deck in Crimson Vow. I like the blood mechanic in general because it's very nice and low-powered, but it still helps decks deal with issues like Mana Flood. The thing I really like about this card in particular is how simple it is. Yet, it also overlaps into multiple decks as a nice common to have around. The life gain is great in black-white, the blood is great in black-red, and the high toughness can sometimes be useful in black-green. I think cards like this are great for limited. It isn't crazy powerful, but it does a nice job in all of those decks. At number 5, I have Eye Twitch. It sort of stands in for all the learn and lesson cards in Strixhaven. I really think that mechanic was a great one, as it introduced an intriguing angle in Limited, where you have to consider taking lessons so that you could learn for them. If your deck didn't have a nice balance of learn and lesson going on, you were going to be at a real disadvantage in that format. I'm always a fan of toolboxes in Magic, and I love the toolboxy feel that learning and lessons gave you. 
It just ended up being very strong, even if the card you grabbed wouldn't normally be very good in a vacuum. But when you staple a free card to a 1-mana one 1-1 one -one flyer like I Twitch here, it feels pretty good. At number 4, I have Priest of the Haunted Edge. So, just like I Twitch represented all the learn lesson stuff in Strixhaven, Priest of the Haunted Edge sort of represents all the snowlands and snow payoffs in Kaldheim. Just like taking lessons during draft made for some very interesting decisions, both during the draft and in-game, the same was true of Snowlands in Kaldheim. A payoff like the Priest was particularly interesting because it isn't the kind of snow payoff that does its thing even if you only have one snow thing around. I mean, I guess it technically does, but it doesn't do enough unless you have a critical mass of snow. This really incentivized taking snow lands over all sorts of reasonable cards in the format, and I like anything that makes the draft portion more interesting, and taking snow lands is definitely an interesting thing to do. With the Priest, it also didn't hurt that there were multiple ways to recur it, making it really, really nice. At number three, I've got Bookworm. Like I mentioned earlier, I like slow, grindy games the most, so it shouldn't come as much of a surprise that Bookworm is pretty high on this list. Like Rise of the Ants, Bookworm is an expensive thing that, if you cast it, it's pretty hard for your opponent to win. You gain life and draw a card, and then the Bookworm doesn't even go away permanently. It just gives you a ton of value. And ramp decks in Strixhaven were very much a real thing, and this was one of the best payoffs for that in the deck. In Crimson Vow, there is sort of a similar worm in Bramble Worm, but it isn't nearly as impressive as Bookworm was. At number two, it is Svela, Ice Shaper. I've already mentioned liking snow and ramp decks, so it shouldn't be too surprising Svela is here. Kaldheim had a lot of really great signposts and commons, many of which also almost made this list, but in the end, Svela is the only one from that set that made it. It's amazing that she has an ability to turn out snow mana producing tokens, while also having an incredible ramp payoff as an activated ability, and it really allowed her to take over games. Even if your opponent did find a way to deal with her before you could use her ability, the fact you still gained the mana was great. She was a ton of fun to play with. And at number one, I have Minsk, Beloved Ranger. This is a card I like a lot for reasons outside of Limited. You might think that it's because I love Baldur's Gate or Dungeons and Dragons or something, but I have never played either, though Minsk makes me want to. Anyway, Minsk is a really fun card, even if you aren't fully aware of the lore he's based on. I mean, he makes a freaking hamster token. But yeah, what I really like about Minsk is the whole hamster thing. If you didn't know already, my wife and I volunteer for a local pet rescue taking care of various rodents, who were surrendered or who have challenging medical situations, and we take care of them until they can be adopted or until they pass away. And at any given time, we have several rodents in the house. Right now, for example, there are four hamsters, two mice, and two rats. So, like Minsk, I'm a bald guy who loves small rodents, so it was hard for me not to think that this was awesome. Unfortunately, I never even saw one in a booster pack despite doing 40-plus drafts, However, when I opened up a few collector's boosters on stream that Wizards sent me, I was lucky enough to open up a foil Minsk, something that there wasn't a great chance of doing, and that more than made up for me never getting to play with Minsk in Limited. Well, those are the 10 cards that were printed in 2021 that I liked the most. What were your favorite cards of the year? Let me know in the comments. If you want to own any of these cards, and I think you should want to own them all, of course, you can find links in the description that will take you directly to their page in the Card Kingdom store. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and share it so that others will enjoy it too. If you want to stay aware of new MTG Top 10s as we head into the new year, don't forget to subscribe and turn on notifications. If you want to catch up on past MTG Top 10s, including more about my personal favorite cards, you should see some playlists on your screen shortly. Lastly, if you want to go the extra mile in supporting the channel, you can do that on Patreon. Thanks for watching.